Good evening, members of Redeemer, friends. It's good for us to gather around God's Word and we continue tonight to look at uh, that second oracle prophecy of uh, the weapon of mass destruction that uh, the Moabite king wanted to use to bring curse on God's people, but instead of curse, God continues to bless his people. Now, last night we saw in the second prophecy there in Numbers uh, 23, uh, uh, it begins in, in verse 18, this prophecy that uh, the Lord uses this prophet to underline for his people his own character and the beauty and the glory of his character. And now the Lord is going to speak um, to us and reveal to us uh, the blessing of his presence among his people. The prophet Balaam, the false prophet, makes very clear that he cannot speak against God. He cannot twist God's word to fit the king's desires. He is paralyzed and he has to obey the command of God and speak only God's word. Behold, he says in verse 20, I received the command to bless he is blessed and I cannot revoke it. I am only captive to the word of God. Now this is stunning for a false prophet. You see, God has crushed the body of these men who were seeking through their manipulation of the gods to bring curse on God's people. But God will not stand for that. And so he comes and the prophet continues now. Not only does he highlight the, the, the word of God uh, in its revealing truth about God that we need to believe and the, the promises of God and the command to obey God. Now he reveals to us that God's presence among the Israelites is what make them so special. Notice what he speaks about in verse 21. He has, and this is the prophet looking on, um, Balaam, he says, he has not beheld misfortune in Jacob and has not seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them and the shout of a king is among them. So he's saying that God is present and I cannot see misfortune or trouble. I cannot see because God's presence is already a blessing for his people. God is with them. He is like a king among his people. It's he and his rule that sets them apart. And now he underlines that power that God has done. No misfortune will come upon them or can come upon them because of God's presence. God brings them out of Egypt and is for them like the horns of the wild ox. God is the one who fights for them. He is like a wild boar that runs wild and destroys enemies with, with his, uh, the word there is, is almost antlers, but a, a boar doesn't have antlers. That's why it's translated horn. But it's, it's that the Lord is the one who fights for them with a ferocious passion we saw it in the destruction of Pharaoh uh, in the Red Sea 
You know, we, we, we read about that in, in what God has done to Egypt and how also in these two other kings that were defeated by the Israelites. And so he says in verse 23, For there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob in Israel, What has God wrought? In Israel, among God's people, there is no uh, um, enchantment, no omens, no necromancy, no false uh, divination. All the things that you find through uh, uh, the pagan nations, where they, through their techniques, manipulate the gods to get their agendas spoken. No, in Israel, God alone reigns and his word is law. And he not only speaks, but he does. And so we stand amazed and said, what has God done? And that's the question, isn't it? What is God doing? Now, this is special importance for us living now after the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are reminded again and again in the word that we are not our own masters, but the Lord is the master of his people. He rules and is control of all things. And so we need to ask, what has God wrought? And in Christ, we see that he brings salvation, a greater deliverance than the deliverance of Egypt. That what we desire as human beings in the depth of our being to have peace with God comes at great expense to the Lord Jesus Christ. God has brought salvation. And we receive that salvation by surrendering our desire to control our own lives, to be our own masters, to have our will and agenda triumph. We repent and we acknowledge the sin of trying to be our own God and we cling to Christ. Behold a people. As a lioness, it rises up, and as a lion, it lifts itself. It does not lie down until it's devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. Here, the prophet Balaam goes further, and he declares that the Israelites are now like the king of the beasts, a lioness and a lion, and all who come before it, they will destroy. And the imagery here is, 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 is gruesome. Drunk. The blood of the slain. Devour the prey. Well, it's the language of victory over enemies, the language of, of destruction. And so he is seeing here that God's presence with his people will make them victors. Now this is important because as uh, New Testament believers, we know that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a savior who has delivered us from the greatest enemies, sin, death, Satan. Christ brings us that ultimate victory. And that's why the apostle say, says in, in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. We are victors 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's people are a special people. And here this pagan prophet declares it for the world to see. Now just for a moment, before we just look again at the reaction of this king, just think of what this prophecy is meant to do for Israel. They are unaware of this struggle taking a place around them. They are unaware of the attempts to curse them that is backfiring. They know nothing of this. They will find out only afterwards. You see, God is showing how he protects his people, how he fights for his people. Now, that's a, such a great encouragement. I've, I've mentioned it before, but it's so important to see. God is the one who defends us as his people. And we're not always even aware of it, of the battles that God is fighting on our behalf. But be assured that in Christ, God makes clear that he is for us. And those who belong to Christ belong to him. And he has bound himself to us. In baptism, God says, I am yours. And he claims us for his own. And we need to answer and say, yes, Lord. And when we do, we live in that beautiful relationship under God's control. And no enemy, no enemy can destroy God's uh, uh, special relationship with his people. What a privilege we have. But now these two men are in consternation because this king wants a curse and instead he gets a blessing. And not just one, but two. And so the king is exasperated. And Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all, and do not bless them at all. Stop speaking. Don't say anything. Just, just don't. And Balaam answered Balak, Did I not tell you all that the Lord says I must do? I am not in control of my tongue and my message. God controls it. But do you see the exasperation here? They thought they can manipulate the gods. And now Yahweh has come. And they discover the pious rhetoric that Balaam has used is now the truth. Because God is speaking and the prophet is helpless. Again, he is like the donkey. Like the donkey. And Balak is like Balaam on the donkey. His leg is being squeezed. And now they're going to try once again the third time. And we'll look at that, Lord willing. Uh, in our next visit together. So let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that you set your people apart and that by the Lord Jesus Christ we are a special people, your treasured possession. And we pray that that reality of your presence that makes us different would be known by us. And we thank you that you protect your people in this world. Even though we are often unaware of it, this story reminds us again and again that those for whom you are for are more than conquerors because you are fighting their battles for them. Thank you for knowing this, Lord. We pray for all your people 
And for all who suffer and are in need of your sustaining hand, give them grace. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. May the Lord bless you and your family tonight. Bye-bye.